We got some fans out there. The Extra Most Bestest Pizza is properly named Extra Most Bestest. It's at Little Caesars. You pay literally just $1 more and you get double the cheese and double the pepperoni. It is so good. Like I, I go for that over almost any other pizza ever. I mean, the Extra Most Bestest is truly Extra Most Bestest. Um, Hannah and I, we were uh, hanging out with a friend of mine. And uh, for those of you that know me, know that I can be pretty sarcastic at times. Um, and sometimes my sarcasm is very much just straight faced. And sometimes my sarcasm is um, like smiling or laughing while I'm doing it to make you like further question kind of, you know, you guys know how sarcasm works, right? Well, so I'm telling my friend about the extra most bestest pizza. I'm being for real. You know, this is nothing to joke about. And my wife's there and she sees his skepticism because like extra most bestest, he had never heard of it. Like it's a weird name, right? So she sees his skepticism and she's, she kind of looks at him and she's like, nah, like it's, it's not real. And so he's like, nah, I don't believe it. You're just, you're making it up. You're trying to trick me. And I'm like, I'm laughing and I'm like, you know, I'm like, dude, like, I don't know what I can tell you more to get you to believe that this is true. Like the extra most best pizza is like the best ever and it's real. And I guess I can't do anything else to like make you believe that it's true. And he's like, nope, not true. And so a couple weeks later, maybe even like a full month later, um, <clears throat> I see him again and he comes up to me. He's like, dude, the extra most bestest pizza is a thing. And I'm like, yeah, I told you. I told you it was a thing, but you wouldn't believe me. And so uh, my wife, Hannah, was playing off of what she knew about both of us. And she was able to put that bit of doubt in his mind to where he did not believe that there was <coughs> an actual extra most bestest pizza. Um, and, and think about all the extra most pizza, bestest pizzas that he missed out on in a month's time. That could be like 30 pizzas. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, so he missed out on a lot of pizzas because Hannah put that doubt in his mind. And that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight is doubt and belief. Um, and so if you guys want to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 20, um, or, or you can go in your U version. Um, we have the, the outlines in U version. Uh, for those of you that, that maybe don't know how to use U version, you, you click on the Bible app, um, you click on events. And then it should pop up with a little map, and you can click on Catalyst. It should be like, you'll see a little map of S&T, actually, and then you'll click on Catalyst. Um, and you can click on that, and our, our notes are in those every week. We're going to be talking about doubt and belief. So let's read through the passage, John chapter 20, verses 24 through 27. It says, Now Thomas was one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so this is our third and last um, passage where we're going to be looking at people with Jesus. And so this last person is Thomas. Um, Thomas is uh, one of the 12 disciples. He's always referred to as the twin. Or that's what the word Thomas means. Um, and so he may have actually been a twin. We don't know. Um, Thomas is mentioned in every gospel and in the book of Acts, but it's only in the gospel of John where he is a little bit more of a main character where, where he actually ever says anything or is quoted as saying anything in the book of John. Um, Thomas is most famously known for his doubting scene, the one that we just read here. Um, but he actually first speaks in John chapter 11, verse 16, where he encourages uh, the other disciples to follow Jesus, even if it means that, uh, that they would die. Um, and so he's like, he's like, let's follow Jesus, even if it means that we're going to die with him. And so we can maybe paint a little bit of a picture of Thomas. Maybe he's um, just a strong-willed person, and when he believes something, he believes it firmly, um, and, he just, and he goes for it. Um, but we don't really know a ton about him. Um, we don't know uh, what he was before Jesus called him, but we do see him fishing with the other disciples after Jesus' resurrection. So we know he's a cool guy because he's a fisherman. Um, I don't really know many of those, but um, they are cool people usually. Um, he was fishing with, with Jesus, or fishing when Jesus came in after his resurrection, and so we know that about him. So he maybe was a fisherman before, um, but he's not a super major player in the characters of Gospels, 
except for this one story. This one story is the one that kind of makes him famous. Um, you guys have heard the, the term Doubting Thomas, right? Thomas will forever be known by this one passage as the doubter, the Doubting Thomas. Um, and so in Thomas's defense, I think we can acknowledge when we look here, if we look at the passage directly before this, um, you know, the, the title is Jesus Appears to the Disciples. Um, and so literally it's like just three verses there, or four verses, and it's basically the exact same scenario of Jesus appearing to the other, ele- or other 10 disciples. And it's like the same exact scenario, but Thomas isn't there. And so Thomas is off doing whatever their version of drowning their sorrows in Netflix binging the office was back then. We don't know what it was. We don't know where he was, and it, it doesn't say it was bad that he wasn't there or anything. It just, he wasn't there. And so he had to wait another week. So we can give him a little bit of credit in the sense of he didn't believe because he didn't see. And the other apostles, they didn't believe either until they saw Jesus. And so um, we'll cut him a little slack of air. Um, <coughs> But one point I want to make before we get into the text is um, this idea of eyewitness testimony. So John is, is giving us an eyewitness testimony of, a, of Thomas uh, seeing Jesus, Thomas and the other 10, um, seeing Jesus after he died, was buried, and resurrected. Um, one of the biggest claims um, against the eyewitness testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, um, and, and a lot of people have to have they kind of have to go this way because um, there's really not much to stand on if you, if you want to say that um, the Gospels are not reliable in their transferability. Um, basically, what I mean by that is what was written 2,000 years ago in those Gospels, um, <coughs> we're very sure that we have almost exactly what they wrote back then because of how many uh, manuscripts and stuff that we have. And so um, since that's not really something that can be attacked, one of the um, major uh, things that people will say to discredit eyewitness accounts is that um, there were mass hallucinations and that the disciples dreamt that they saw Jesus or that they hallucinated that they saw Jesus. And so um, actually Adam, at the preacher at Ridgeview Christian Church, he, he said he talked about this a little bit a couple Sundays ago, and he said, uh, that's not how hallucinations work. And then we all kind of laughed as if he had all this experience with drugs or something. But um, but we understand hallucinations are like, you can't really control a hallucination. And if we had a hallucination, it would be probably totally different, right? Um, but one of the things that I want to point out is that Jesus didn't, uh, he didn't just appear um, one time. And, 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 you know, maybe they all kind of like dreamt it or, or came up with the story together. And then that was it. And they, they based it all off of that. Um, in this story already, in, in John, we have Jesus appearing to Mary Magdalene and the other Mary um, at the tomb. Uh, then he appears to the disciples um, later, later, that, uh, later that day. Um, and, then, and then in our story, we see Jesus appearing to Thomas. Um, and so I wanted to give just a quick, um, a quick rundown of the other times that Jesus um, appeared and that we have that, um, those occurrences uh, recorded. And so in Matthew 28, we have, again, both Marys seeing the risen Savior and then the 11 disciples seeing him on a mountain where Jesus gave them the Great Commission. Mark details three separate appearances. Uh, Luke shows three, if not four, appearances, (coughs) depending on the exact order of events. And then Acts speaks of Jesus revealing his risen self over the course of 40 days and describes his ascension. Um, And then Paul later speaks of how there were many still alive at the point that Paul wrote his letter. Um, who could attest to the fact that they saw Jesus risen. And then in John, we have the most um, appearances of Jesus. We have five different appearances <coughs> at different times to different people. And so uh, the reason I bring this up, the reason I kind of go down this little uh, rabbit trail, if you will, is, is that I want to emphasize that the resurrected Jesus was no Bigfoot sighting. Um, how many of you guys have ever watched like finding Bigfoot or like true ghost hunters or something like that. Yeah, they're kind of amusing, right? Because usually it's a bunch of guys and they're like sneaking through like a little house or something. They got some like really junky lights and then all of a sudden one of them's like, shh, shh, did you hear that? Did you hear that? And then by the time they can all be quiet and like hear something like it's gone, okay? Or like, did you see that? Did you see that? And then they all look over and nobody really sees it. But by the end of the show, they're kind of like, yeah, we we know there's a Bigfoot in this area. You know, we, we had one sighting. Um, We definitely heard the scream of a ghost, and so uh, we've got it on recording. It's a little muffled, but, you know, they're like sure of it, right? 
And so the reason I bring this up is to show that, that multiple occurrences of Jesus, it wasn't like a Bigfoot sighting where somebody was like, there's Jesus, there's Jesus. And then everybody looks and they didn't see him. And then they, after a couple days or weeks, they kind of convinced themselves that they had all seen Jesus. Um, that's not what's going on here. And so there is actual validity and proof, even in the way that these gospels were put together. But with that being said, um, there are still some people who will not believe until they see or they touch like Thomas wanted, right? That was, uh, <coughs> that was Thomas's, uh, uh, the, Thomas's need. He, he said, I won't, I won't believe until I see him and I touch the scars on his, on his wrist and the, the scar in his side. And so um, even people today who struggle with the same, uh, the same doubts that Thomas had. And, and so that's exactly what our passage deals with tonight, tonight is, these, is, is doubts. <laughs> Um, which brings us to our point of, of the passage. Our point of the passage is that doubts aren't bad, staying there is. So that's our point. Doubts aren't bad, staying there, staying in your doubts is. And so we'll, we'll look at that more as we walk through the text. So if you join with me in verse 24, we'll walk through the passage together. Verse 24, now Thomas was one of the 12 called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So again, um, Thomas's doubts here uh, don't lead him to disloyalty or anything like that. Thomas just wasn't there when, when, uh, when Jesus appeared to the other disciples, and that's really kind of all there is to it. Sometimes people will speculate about Thomas or um, say, oh, maybe he was like pouting or something. We just don't know. He just wasn't there. Um, verse 25, so the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. So the other disciples, they come and they tell Thomas, they're like, dude, we have seen Jesus. He's resurrected. And Thomas is like, no. He's like, I will not believe. I need every shred of proof to believe. And so uh, Thomas is generally regarded as a skeptic because of this statement, which may be true, but he just wanted proof like they did. Um, and now I, I want to bring up the point, sometimes we feel like Thomas too, don't we? I mean, sometimes we have doubts as well. And maybe they're big doubts. Maybe they're really big doubts, kind of like Thomas. I mean, Thomas doubting the resurrection of Jesus, that's a, that's a big doubt, right? I mean, that's a, that's a hinge of, of faith. And sometimes we have big doubts too. Maybe, maybe it's about the resurrection of Jesus. Maybe, maybe it's about the reliability of Scripture. Um, maybe, maybe it's smaller doubts that, that nag at us, doubts that kind of uh, eat at us every day. Maybe, maybe we doubt that, that God... Uh, really loves us. Um, maybe we doubt that God will really come through for us in a time of need. And I think that you guys can agree with me when I say that we live in a culture that is constantly um, trying to tear down our beliefs as Christians, um, constantly trying to tear away at the structures that we have of faith. And that can sometimes uh, lead to a culture, even within Christianity, where it's really hard and scary to voice the doubts that we have where it's really hard to, to acknowledge that we don't know everything. It's really, really hard to acknowledge that we have a doubt, that we have things that we're struggling with. And maybe even sometimes it's just as simple as looking around and saying, man, I don't want, I don't want like the rest of my peers to think that you know, I'm not as like, strong of a Christian as them or something like that. And so there's all these things that can make it really hard for us to, to voice our doubts. But I think that we see here in the passage that doubts aren't bad, staying there is. And in the coming verses, we'll see how Jesus met Thomas in his doubts. He didn't chastise him for doubting, but he met him in his doubts. He gave him what he needed to have faith, to believe, and then he helped Thomas move forward out of those doubts. Read with me in verse 26. It says, eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Um, so the funny part about this verse is that is, it is pretty much exactly the same as like the description of the occurrence of Jesus coming uh, to the other apostles in the previous passage. Um, the doors were locked. Um, Jesus comes in and he says his normal greeting, peace be with you. Um, and the eight days thing, it, was one, it, it would have been one week later. Eight days, that was a, kind of an inclusive um, way of counting uh, uh, weeks that they did back then. So they would have counted Sunday as one day and then all the way through and then 
the other day. So like a week for them was eight days. I don't know, kind of weird. But same day. Um, so Thomas waited a week, our, our way of saying it, um, to see Jesus again. <coughs> Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So this is Jesus, resurrected Jesus, coming to Thomas. He says, hey, I know what you wanted to have faith. Now, do it. Here I am. Here's, here's the marks on my wrist. Here's the mark in my side. And so I want to mention a couple things that are going on here in verse 27 um, that, that I don't want us to miss. The first thing that's going on here is, uh, is that Jesus says, be not faithless, right? He says, put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not believe, but believe. So he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. And so what Jesus is saying is here is he is implying that there can be no lasting faith apart from faith in the risen Christ. There can be no lasting faith apart from faith in the risen Christ, the resurrected Jesus. And so Paul, Paul actually uh, kind of affirms this in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, where he says, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So Paul is simply repeating Jesus kind of in more words. He's saying, if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you don't believe in Jesus. And that was the one thing that Thomas was doubting, right? Was that Jesus, he, he saw him die. He, he, he maybe even saw him go into the tomb, but he didn't believe that he resurrected. Jesus is saying, do not disbelieve, but believe. The second thing that I want us to, to notice here is that Jesus, even in his resurrected body, still has scars, Right? He's got the marks on his hands and the mark on his side where they put the spear in. And so Jesus does not <coughs> return back to God the Father in heaven the same as he left. Jesus, in his post-crucifixion resurrection body, still has the marks and the scars from his torture and death. And we see that here. Thomas saw that. Jesus said, here, touch, see, look at the scars from my crucifixion. Um, and we see this uh, with Thomas in this story, and we see this in Revelation chapter 5 as well. Um, it's on your U version if, if you have that open. But Revelation chapter 5, verse 6 um, is actually a vision that, that John has, um, same writer of this book, later um, in his life. Um, and it's a, it's a vision of kind of a heavenly courtroom, and it says, And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. That's talking about Jesus as the lamb. Uh, the sacrificial lamb, standing as though it had been slain. And so what John is seeing there is, is Jesus, the God-man, came to earth as a man, but still fully God, died for our sins on the cross and resurrected, but still has the scars of our salvation. Even in his resurrection body, he still has the marks of his sacrifice for us. I mean, I think this is pretty powerful when we, when we dwell on this. Um, you know, Jesus, who is God, decided to come and, and, and pay a price for us. And, and that price has already been paid. But Jesus, for the rest of eternity, will still bear the marks of our salvation. Will still bear the marks of the punishment for our sin. For all the rest of eternity. In Revelation 5, it goes on to um, a poem that is in praise of Jesus. In Revelation 5, 12, and it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and might and honor and glory and blessing. My friends, worthy is Jesus our Savior who will forevermore bear the scars of our sin. Jesus paid the price for us. And thirdly, the last thing I want us to notice about verse 27 is that G Jesus... Jesus invites Thomas to carry out the necessary um, tests of faith that Thomas himself had come up with. Um, and this is where I want us to really kind of hone in on our point, right? So Thomas is doubting. Um, we look at verse 27, and, and Jesus is there. He says, peace be with you. He says, put your finger here. See my hands. Put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And so Jesus comes to Thomas, and, you know, Thomas didn't tell Jesus what his, like, terms and conditions were, but Jesus knew because he's God. Um, and then also Jesus, I guess, came through a locked door or a closed door. And so that's also like shocking. And then you see Jesus, the one who's 
you saw crucified and buried in a tomb also standing there in a physical body. That's also pretty shocking. Um, and so Thomas is, is, is like, wow, okay. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus is saying, hey, I know what you wanted. I know what you need for your faith. And so come, see, take what you need for faith. And so this is where I want to kind of hone in on our point. Doubts aren't bad, but staying there is. You see, what Jesus was doing here is he was meeting Thomas in his doubts. He acknowledged that Thomas had these doubts, and Jesus met him there and gave him what he needed to go further, not in unbelief, not in doubt, but to go further into belief. Jesus didn't slap him upside the head and say, dude, I told you that the extra most bestest pizza was a real thing, um, like I wanted to do with my friend. You know, he, he didn't slap him and be like, dude, how many times did I have to tell you I was going to rise again, you know? Um, why didn't you believe me? No. Jesus didn't even say, hey, for the rest of the church age, you know, they're going to call you the Doubting Thomas. Um, (laughs) We gave that title to him. Jesus didn't. Um, So bummer, Thomas, I guess. But he's a relatable character, right? But Jesus didn't say any of these things. He just came and he met him where he was. Doubts aren't bad. Staying in those doubts is. And I think Jesus is willing to meet us in our doubts as well. He doesn't want us to just stay there. So let's think about this for a minute. If, if we're Christians and we have doubts, um, and a lot of us probably do to some degree or another, right? Um, but if we're Christians, we believe a couple things. We believe that God is real. We believe that his word is reliable. We believe in the resurrection of Jesus, right? Those are some foundations of our faith. And essentially, as Christians, um, we believe in the truth. And so if we, if we believe that, that what we believe <laughs> is true, then doubts shouldn't be all that scary, right? Questions shouldn't be all that scary for us. Now, there's some really good, um, there's some really good tests of faith out there. So there's some really uh, tough questions um, that can really, really uh, kind of put us in a corner with our faith. There's some really well-worded um, people <coughs> that can make us think a good couple times about our faith, right? Um, we can acknowledge that, <coughs> But if we believe that, that we know the truth, then we should also believe that we can find our way to, through any question or any doubt. You see, doubts, these questions and, and doubts, that's not what should scare us. Staying in those doubts and staying in those questions is what should scare us. You see, Thomas, he, he could have stayed in, in his unbelief. He could have been like, no, you guys are lying to me. I'm done. I'm out. I'm going home to wherever he was from. And he would have stayed in his unbelief. You see, we have a lot to lose if we stay in our doubts and we don't move towards belief. I have a really good friend of mine who runs an apologetics ministry, and he always says, um, yeah, Will, you know him. Uh, He always says, uh, good questions deserve good answers. Good questions deserve good answers. And I think that that should be a great motto for us as Christians, right? When we have doubts, when we have questions, when other people around us have doubts, have questions, we should be able to provide good answers or at least be able to search for them and know that if we, what we believe is true, then we're going to still find the truth. No matter how hard it is to get to those, those questions or get through those doubts, we're still going to find the truth. You see, sometimes other people are producing the questions and sometimes we are. And the doubts and the questions aren't bad, but staying in them, wallowing in them, sinking further and further in disbelief. That's what's bad. And we can trust that just as Jesus met Thomas in his doubts, that he will meet us there too. And I think that Jesus is saying the same thing to us as he did to Thomas. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Verse 28, Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God, exclamation point. (laughs) Um, I wish I could have been there in that moment. But Thomas is making a very declarative statement here. Um, He says, my Lord and my God. F.F. Bruce in his commentary on John says um, that this is a declarative statement of absolute conviction by Thomas. Uh, He says, Thomas's confection thus collaborates the prologue to the gospel, the word was God. And so a lot of commentators look at this as the the climax of the ending of the book, where where, uh, Thomas looks at Jesus Jesus and he says, my Lord and my God which brings us back to a couple weeks ago where we looked at the first uh, chapter in John, the prologue, where it was the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
So Thomas is acknowledging that here. He's saying, you are my Lord, you are my God. And then John, of course, moves directly into um, his purpose of the book in verse 30, where he says, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So I want to ask you guys, what doubts do we have that are preventing us from making a statement of absolute conviction like Thomas did? There's another story of Jesus meeting someone in his doubts. Um, actually, I was going to have it up on the screen, but I, I forgot. So it's in Mark chapter 9. I think it's on the U version. Um, and I'm going to read a, a little bit of it. But it's a man who, who uh, ha- has a, a boy that is demon-possessed. And he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, can you help us? Can you help us? Um, and he comes to Jesus and he says, in verse 23, he says, Mark chapter 9, 23 says, And Jesus said to him, If you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. And so the rest of the story is Jesus going and, and, and healing this man's son of, of, this, of, this, of this demon possession. But what, what a relatable story, right? What a genuine statement by that man. He says, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And so basically what what this man is saying is, is, Jesus, I believe, but help me because there's a few things that are just holding me back. I just can't force myself to get there all the way. Help me in this. Again, Jesus didn't slap him and say, dude, come on, I'm the Messiah. You should know. Come on. Jesus said, okay, and went with him and healed his son. He showed him what he needed. He gave him what he needed to believe. Jesus wasn't angry at Peter for only walking on water a little bit. He wasn't angry at this man, and he wasn't angry at Thomas either. He simply met the people in their doubts and asked them to believe. He asked them to trust him, asked them to put their faith in him. You see, doubts aren't bad. Questions aren't bad. Staying there is. And so our application for this passage is is really three simple, actionable items. So those of you that like writing, uh, taking down notes, um, Here they are. So the first one is, uh, we need to admit our doubts. We need to be able to just admit our doubts. Um, Thomas did, this man did. Uh, Being honest with the fact that we have doubts is kind of, right, it's the first step to recovery. No, um, but we need to be able to admit our doubts because I I think when we just wallow in them and we just let them kind of fester and bug at us day in and day out, that's when it really does damage. That's when the enemy really gets in and works in those doubts. and if you don't have any major doubts, don't come up with them just, just to have a doubt. Um, praise God that you don't have anything, uh, any major doubts kind of holding you back from, um, from full-out belief or, or, or really um, hindering your faith. Praise God. Um, but I think that we need to admit our doubts. Number two is we need to pray and ask Jesus to meet us in our doubts like he did with Thomas. Um, now, Jesus goes on to mention uh, in verse 29, which we'll read in a second, he, he mentions that uh, he says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. And so Jesus is acknowledging in that passage that, uh, that there's going to be a lot more people that will not see him um, and yet still will believe in that there's an extra blessing because of that. And so Jesus isn't probably going to uh, physically appear to you and show you the marks, right, like he did with Thomas. Um, But I still believe that we can pray that Jesus will meet us in our doubts and that he will help us overcome our doubts. And so that's the second step. Number three is we need to do our part to move out of those doubts. Um, Maybe that's talking with some some friends. Hey, you know, this is something I've been really struggling with. Um, I really just am not feeling like God loves me or that God cares for me. You know, what, what do you have to say about this? Maybe your friends can point you to some scripture. Hey, I'm really struggling with um, the fact that, you know, 2,000 years ago, somebody wrote this down. How, how did it actually get transferred here to where we are now? Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's books about that. There's other people that know a lot about that. Um, basically, we need to do our part uh, of faith and, and move out of these doubts instead of just sitting in them. And so I think this application is, is very easily found in the story of the, the father with a demon-possessed boy, where you, we can voice this to Jesus too, saying, Lord, Jesus, I believe, help me in my unbelief, help me in my doubts, meet me in my doubts. Verse 29, it's kind of a tagline to the end of our passage here. 
It says, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you, haven't, because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So a lot of people talk about this uh, verse and they call it the final beatitude of Jesus. Now, beatitude is just a really fancy word for blessing. Um, so it's the final blessing of Jesus. The other ones that Jesus had were like in the Sermon of the Mount, like blessed are the meek, blessed are the this and that. Um, this is the final beatitude. So blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Um, so this final beatitude really is, is pretty cool. It has a, a special message for some of the first readers of the Gospel of John um, who would not have seen Jesus all the way throughout the entire church age till Jesus comes again and, and makes everything right. Um, it's a special message for us today as well. Even the disciples, um, they saw and believed. And uh, I think that this beatitude is so cool because it's kind of the one thing uh, that we have that the disciples don't, right? I mean, if you think about it, the disciples had a very clear advantage over us um, in their obstacles to faith, right? They walked with Jesus, they saw him die, saw him go in the tomb, and then they saw him resurrected, right? I mean, that's, we can all admit that's a, a clear advantage in obstacles to faith. I mean, that's, that's very clear. And so when we look at this, it's like, all right, well, you know, I'm a little jealous of the apostles, got to walk with Jesus, but they don't get this. They did see Jesus. We get this one. Jesus had us in mind when he said this. Jesus said to them, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so the other thing that I think is so cool about this verse is that Jesus in his resurrected body, after he has completed his mission, completed the work that he came to do, not only is he coming to Thomas to meet him in his doubts, but he also has us in mind today when he says this. He has everybody from for a couple thousand years all the way up to me and you and you and you, all of us in mind when he says this. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so again, we see Jesus meeting us in our doubts, acknowledging that it'll be harder for us as Christians who have not seen to still believe in his resurrection, to still believe in him as God, to still believe in him as our savior. So doubts aren't bad, staying there is. What doubts do you need to take to Jesus so that you can declare as definitively as Thomas did, my Lord and my God? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you now, and we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for uh, the people that wrote, wrote it down so that we could, um, we could read about you and we could know about you, and we could, as, as John says, we could uh, read these words and believe that you are the Son of God, the Savior of the world, who paid the price for our sins. God, we thank you for that, and we love you. God, I pray that we would um, take this message and that we would um, no longer hide from our doubts or, or let our doubts um, eat away at us um, day in and day out, but that we would um, pray that you would meet us in our doubts and give us what we need to move further in our faith. And that we could move further out of unbelief into belief. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.